Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico. Hello, I'm Lorene Mills, and welcome to Report from Santa Fe. Our guest today is beloved New Mexico writer Max Evans. Thank you for joining us. Well, I'm happy to be here anywhere. Well, we're ha- <laughs> we have been doing shows since the 90s, and uh, you are one of my favorite writers. You are so amazing. Uh, I want people to, to, to remember some of the things you've done. You wrote 50 years ago. You wrote The Rounders. Wonderful book. Became a movie with Henry Fonda and Glenn Ford. You also f- penned another film called The High Low Country. And one of your early, early books was a magnificent epic, and it's called Blue Feather Fellini. This is a, a, a magnificent book. You've dealt in nonfiction. You wrote a wonderful biography of Madame Millie. This is still one of your best-selling books, a book that I just love that's about you that Slim Randalls wrote. It's called Old Max Evans, The First Thousand Years. Honestly, the read about your life is almost as good as your own stories. We're here today to celebrate your brand new book. It's a compilation of stories from an entire lifetime of writing. It's called Animal Stories. And it was earlier titled Animal Magic because these are the most extraordinary stories. So you have been everything in life, a painter, a miner, a professional calf roper, a soldier in World War II. You were a wonderful artist. Someday you will get back to that, and a writer. So talk to me about about your new book, Animal Stories, and, and, and what is it about animal magic that has intrigued you all these years? Well, there's a dimension. If you're close to animals, there's a dimension that you discover it, over time. That's, that's, it was magic to me, and it becomes a very a spiritual thing almost a quest if you've been around them long enough. And uh, when I talk about animals, I don't mean just out observing them. I've hunted them and, uh, for food, and I've done things to protect them. I've written the best I could about them uh, over a, a long lifetime of writing. And uh, I, I feel just as close to them as I would one of my own children, most animals. Well, um In literature, there was a movement called magical realism. They came up with this term in the 80s with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, his work, 100 Years of Solitude. You were were doing this way before that. You know, 30 years ago, you were observing nature so keenly. Magical realism is defined as having magic be a natural part of the natural world, and that's how you see the world anyway, isn't it? Yes, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't. I never heard that term ever, and it's 20, 30 years later that I, the first time I ever heard it was uh, uh, the Hundred Years of Solitude, the, the one you just mentioned, and I, I, and then after some of our local writers, Rudolph and I and others, uh, were, were told that they were doing magical realism, I realized I was too, and. Uh, it applies to animals, especially in my animal work. It comes out in me. I can't help it. Uh, things I've witnessed, experienced, that touched me deeply, affected my whole life, and especially my my creating, my writing. Well, this sensitivity you, you've had to animals, uh, it goes way back to when you were a kid. Yeah, it all started... Uh, indirectly, when I really got in trouble, my father had started a little town in uh, southeastern New Mexico. He'd founded it, called Humble City. The, the the thing is, I had to hunt. I didn't know it. I loved it, but I had to hunt rabbits and and I learned to twist them out of the hole and uh, to, for our table. We the cattle were all killed in the Great Depression. The, the government bought them and killed them. Ten dollars a head and push them in a ditch, so there wasn't much to eat in the way of meat, and we all worked very hard. But it was very natural to me. I just loved it, uh, every minute of it. 
and I started becoming close to animals because we were surviving with them. Yeah. And I hunted with dogs. I hunted horseback. And uh, if I, I was so in love with my dogs, Lorene, because I was so close to them. And, and they were sharing uh, uh, what was to me an absolute wonderful duty. Mm-hmm. They were sharing it in a beautiful way. And uh, so there was, there was a kid that lived a few blocks from us in that little town. Everybody was a few blocks. <laughs> Several <laughs> blocks. Never did, I think, maybe 30, 40 people is all my father ever, ever got to come there. He did build a school, had a little post office. My mother ran that. and uh, But this kid, for some reason, I don't know whether it's jealousy or what, but he, he's always throwing a rocket at, at my dog. And uh, one time he hit him, and I warned him. I told him, don't do that anymore, because that dog was, was exactly a, a brother, a sister, uh, a, a whole total companionship in one, one bundle. We hunted, we lived together, we, we did necessary things for survival, and I just naturally loved that dog, and with all my heart. And the, the second time he, he, he did that, it really hurt my dog. He was limping off and he, he yelled, and I, without thinking, I, uh, my grandfather had come by a few days before and g- given me a little 10 cent pocket knife. Uh. And I, I took after him and I was thinking, if I can catch him, I'm gonna do something to him because he's jeopardizing our welfare of our family and, and all of our domesticated animals, everything else. And as he went up on his porch, it was about a two or three foot porch, I caught him and uh, did the first violent thing of my life, and one of the last, you know, in a way, except when I needed to in the war. But I threw him down, and I, the strength came to me because I was so upset about my dog. And I got his hand out there, and I got, I, somehow I got that little knife open, little it, the blade was just thin, yeah. <laughs> and I stuck it through his hand and stuck him to the porch. And he, I said, now, uh, see if that hand can throw a, a rock with great accuracy. And uh, he was screaming and yelling, and I just walked off. And uh, so somehow that got to the school board. I never did know what it had with the school board. And they expelled me from school. And so that was a great tragedy all the way around. And my parents decided they'd send me just over the line into West Texas to stay with my, my grandmother to finish out the school year, which is most of the year. And that's where my first real uh, t- a time spent in, in my first vision of the spiritual world without anybody ever telling me anything about it at all. She would, she would read for neighbors. They'd drop by. They'd have problems, uh, and they, she'd help them solve them. They'd want to know a little about the future, I assume. She'd, some, for some of them, she's reading tea leaves or coffee grounds, which, as I learned later, would be was simply a focal point it, 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 to concentrate whatever, whatever force it, it penetrates there. And uh, she was a wonderful, gentle woman. She had a, a Choctaw and uh, Cherokee heritage. And it, 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 her medicine that she made for these people was drawn from those, those two Indian, American Indian uh, nations. And it, it fascinated me. You know, a, a little kid from over on the other side in New Mexico, here I was out hunting all the time, horseback and foot and every other way, trying to have to suffice with food. And here I am now over there in that, in just out of town there in Texas, out of the little town called Ropes. And I'm there with my grandmother and she's suddenly doing this enormous spiritual thing. You know, it, it, it really affected me. And I, I, she sensed that and she would we'd sit out on a porch and she'd spend two or three hours in the late afternoon talking to me, not telling me to do this, not trying yeah. to, to put anything in, into me that didn't belong there, but just allowing me to listen and observe and, and, and assimilate if I wished. And I did. I, I, I really, really uh, felt 
the things that she was able to do. And the people never left any money. I, I, I did know, I thought, well, they're taking up her life. Why, why don't they uh, pay her something? And of course, they were all poor and in the Great Depression. And they'd leave cakes, pies, a chicken, a few eggs, and that, she would accept those, but she'd never get, take a penny at ever. And uh, I finally asked her about it. And she said, no, I, I, those are what you call love gifts, and that's, that's acceptable. So it opened my mind that, she, that, that this was something that came from the heart. And so I, I started, <clears throat> I think everybody experiences these things in their life. They just don't pay any attention to it. I really do, after all these decades. The, the tea leaves or the coffee leaves is a, a wonderful old tradition, and it often it's just like a way to focus psychic or intuitive abilities. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just kind of gives a, a vehicle for it. Then later on, when you, uh, there, you had many other adventures in between there, but when you were going to marry your wonderful wife, Pat, you came back and had her meet the family and meet your, your grandmother, and... She wanted to, your grandmother wanted to give you a gift that was kind of the, the essence of your experiences with her. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, I'd, I'd be delighted if I can hold together to recall it because it was my first real observation of what you'd call magic. It isn't, it's something else. It's just an, uh, an infinite part of our soul, our blood, our genes. But we were sitting around my father, my mother, Pat, my sister and my grandmother, and I, I knew she'd been uh, ill. She's staying with them instead of her own home. And uh, suddenly she she looked across the room to my mother, and it was an abruptness about it, the way she did it, and yet easy. And she said, Hazel, that was my mother, her daughter, put your hand on that table over there, that little table. My mother didn't know which one she had pointed it out. And so she went over and said, like this? Yes. And, the, and she said, now, 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 Maxie, she called me Maxie. Watch the edge of the table. It grows up. Hmm. My mother was really stunned. And she'd been, a, she'd, she'd been with her her whole uh, life, you know. Yeah. And yet it, it stung, everybody in there was just silent. Pat was there. She could. She, she was this young girl, uh, watching this, and I later I wonder why did that happen? How? Why did she do that? And it, it was really a shocking thing, but we all just contained it and cool. The the thing about it was, I just I, I believed everything about her, and, and it I turned out I was right in my belief. But she took Pat and I off in the kitchen. And she said, Maxie, I'm going to give you a little gift. I'm going to show you how to read tea leaves. So she showed me the mechanics of it. And I, I knew that that mechanics, all that was meaningless. It was just a gesture to concentrate. But in the fact that she's giving me a gift, that's why she'd showed me that extreme measure the, the night before. Mm -hmm. that none of them there who had been around her all their lives had ever witnessed she told uh, Pat and I, she said, you're going to have an adventure. We were going to stop on the New Mexico-Texas border and spend the night with a rancher friend. We did. And Pat just casually, uh, for just something to do at the di dinner table, said, Max, won't you read her tea leaves? And I was embarrassed. I didn't want to do it. So it was coffee grounds instead of tea leaves. But I read them, and I, I started saying things that I saw in there. And uh, the lady just jumped up and had a screaming, raging fit. And I thought, what in the world have I done? The lady of the house, oh, well, she was the owner of the ranch. And it stunned me so. I didn't know what to say or what to do. And all the things I told her, well, right on the state line, she, had a, she owned the bar, the restaurant, and a little store. She owned that building. And she was on a deal to sell it. It was all a secret deal, ah. and uh, nobody was, but the two lawyers knew anything about it, the two participants. They kept it absolutely from anybody knowing at all, and she she was just in a rage. 
she accused me or somebody, her lawyer or somebody had had deceived her and told me. I said, we just got here, you know, a couple of hours ago. And this was something that you had seen and innocently mentioned that there might be a, yeah. a business deal yeah, going I, down around this. I, I, was I didn't secret. think what I was doing. I yeah. just said there was a building right over here. Yeah. And it, there wasn't any other building. It's just her house and, and that thing on the border. She just went crazy, and so did I. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, that, that was the first time I'd ever done anything like that. Myself. And you really hit the nail on the head. It. Yeah. All that. So uh, my grandmother had had deeply, deeply influenced me, and I, I, I knew it then. Yeah. I, right at that moment, I knew. Well, she said, when you, you kids get to Taos, uh, before you get to the horseshoe, how she knew about that, she'd never been to Taos, I don't know. But she said, you're going to run into a terrible blizzard right as you go up that, just before you up the hill, just before you get to the horseshoe. And I, I didn't think any more about it. And, and uh, as it turned out, neither had Pat. And we got up there about dark when we drove up on that, that hill. And uh, that blizzard hit, and we were just so blind. The road was just, oh, I could just barely see the edge of the highway. There's still enough light. And then we, I turned on the car lights, and, 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 but I thought, then Pat said, it's all right, it's all right. Your grandmother told you it'd be yeah. all right. And sure enough, within two minutes, as slow as we were going, that thing lifted, went right on uh, over. Uh. And uh, so... Those those two incidents that you told me were going to happen happened. Now then you returned to your life in Taos, where you were doing some work as a painter, and and your mentor in painting in painting was Woody Crumbo the mm -hmm. Elder, and what tribe was he? He was a Potawatomi. That's it. Yeah. And he is in a way the father of well, one can hardly say that, but a very. In, important early figure in Native American art. Oh yes, he's the first one to ever really get it nationally and internationally publicized. He did that out of Taos. Yes, and you yeah. were very good friends. He was your mentor, <coughs> but didn't he come around almost every day to have his tea leaves ready? Yeah, I knew he was a spiritual man. He said, "Well, Pat told my wife that uh, you could read the tea leaves," so I, I, I couldn't deny it to my mentor. I didn't know what had happened. And I agreed to read his tea leaves. I don't remember what happened the first time, but whatever it was, it blew his mind, whatever whatever came out of it. So it, it turned out that we weren't uh, uh, <laughs> peddling paintings or studying painting or anything else for quite a while. Every single day he got addicted to it. He wanted to come out and have me read the tea leaves. And they certainly weren't all about him because uh, when the Korean War came along, I saw it and I just had a fit. I, I couldn't believe that I'd just been to a terrible war and it, on the, in the infantry and I didn't want to even hear about a war. And I saw that and I just threw a fit. That, it came true. Three days later uh -huh. the Korean War broke out and then I knew something really truly existed here. Yeah. And then little things. The three owls. Yeah. It, uh, I, I, I just... I looked in there and I saw three owls, and I thought, "Do I say anything this silly or not?" And I did. And he said, "Well, yeah. You must have looked out the window. I didn't look out the window. There's a little window there where I painted the north light, and there on the fence sat three owls." So he said, "That's okay. I don't know why he said this, or Woody Crumbo. He said, "I'll dismiss them." So he did made a movement like this, and made us, and they they just screeched, all of them, and just took off. And I, so I, 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 even though he was my mentor, I still tried to be polite and not ask unnecessary questions. I mean, I, I taught that on the ranch and one thing or another, but I just couldn't help it. I said, "What'd you do to those owls?" He said, "Oh, I just twisted a tail feather." Ah, ah, ah. Well. It got to where we weren't doing any work, and uh, uh, he had some paintings around to sell. I, I, I didn't, I didn't had hardly have anything in to sell. Uh, it, 
I, I just traded them and whatever I could get, ten dollars or twenty or something like that. So I, I got out of paintings, and I thought well, we're going to have to stop this, or or we're go, both going to go under. But it didn't stop, and then it led into another thing that really blew me, me completely away. I, you know, at Taos, they had no mail in the, those days, no mail delivery. They had it just a post office. Well, that's where everybody would meet. Everybody went there every day if they wanted their mail. If you're trying to be a writer and a painter and one thing, another, you're going to go every day and check your mail. And all of a sudden, I was hearing people's thoughts, and it really started bothering me, and I couldn't make it work just if I wanted to. I'd look at somebody and try to, but it, it, it would only happen on its own. So you would receive, you would kind of mind reading, you would pick up people's thoughts yeah. in a very fragmented and, and disruptive way? What was it like yeah. to hear all those thoughts? Yeah, it was terrifying because uh, at first I was kind of fascinated. I thought, well, I'm going crazy. I've done this with old Woody here and I'm losing my cockeyed mind. And I thought, well, I really can't tell anybody about this except Pat. I, I didn't tell Woody at that time. And uh, I, I just didn't know what to do. But I had to stop it. So I thought, I've got to stop, I've got to stop this. It, 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 or I can't continue creating on my own. And so I, I finally told Woody, and he said, well, listen, you've been out and met Mr. Renal at the Pueblo, who was a great medicine man, a spiritualist in, in real medicine. And he'd been handed down a thousand years the line of, of that medicine work that Mr. Benal did. And so I thought, yes, I, tr I really believe in him, trust him totally. And I'd seen him do some really fine things in, with just medicine, not, not yeah. but blessed by, this, by his spirit, whatever spirit he had as working with. And so I went out there on my own and sat down with him and just told him. I said, this is really bothering me. And, uh, and didn't he ask you a very important question? Yes, he did. He, the, the, the next thing he said, well, uh, he, he called me Max. He, he said, Max, do you want to, to be a, an artist or a seer? You can't be both. And I, I don't know whether he meant that in a general sense, but he certainly meant it for, meant it for me. Well, I, you'd think that would dismay me. Instead of that, it, it really did please me. I thought, oh, maybe I've got a way out here with Mr. Bernal. So I said, I want to be an artist. I want this to stop. And so he told me that he's going to give me some, uh, which he'd never done before. I didn't even know he knew what it was, some peyote beans. And I had asked Pat, I said, you've got to go to town and get this and that. i got to do something here. And I didn't know what I'd do. I didn't want any, any, anybody around. So I just uh, placed myself on the bed and just on the pillows, sat up and looked at the wall. And it, I started, it started happening. Here, here's this river. It, it just a great river. And it, it was emerald. It's emerald green, but but absolutely clear. You could you could look at every grain of sand, ah. whitish sand in that in that river, and if, and when I looked closer, it was just moving, just tiny move like this, and it was so beautiful. And then uh, the great trees on the other side, the bank, it was scattered out. They weren't all jammed up, and there was three suns beaming through those trees, oh. and then. I was just hypnotized. I thought, okay, this is supposed to happen. This is what he wanted me to do. I was a little surprised, I imagine, but I was, I was just doing my best to enjoy it. And here comes this guy walking up, and I forget what kind of clothes, this dark clothes. He, he walked up to the edge of that and motioned me like this. Uh-huh. Across. And he kept saying, come on, come on over here. And as if he knew I would. But somehow I knew not to. Somehow I knew I had to conquer that because I thought, well, I can just walk across that vast river. It's shallow. 
It's a, yeah. It's just a big river. It's shallow. I could just walk right across there and be in that glorious place. And I decided no. <clears throat> I didn't decide. It already decided within me and whatever there was existing there. But uh, I told him no, no, I can't come. And that thing, he just. He just smiled, and I don't know how I could see a smile like that across the river. Yeah. But I knew he was smiling. Maybe it was the attitude he had or something. And he slowly, the curtains, it wasn't a curtain, <clears throat> of course not, but it was like a curtain. It just closed up, and he was gone. And to my great relief, I didn't know it at that moment. I went to the post office the next time. Everything was just uh. the usual bumping into one another and the gossip and getting your mail out of the box and and uh, going home. And so that was the end of it mm -hmm. then, then. So Mr. Vanal had certainly known exactly what he was doing. Now, I don't know why this exists, how it existed. I would never be so presumptuous as, as to think I would put this off on anyone else. It's just a story. It happened. I think that this resonated your early spiritual experiences. Uh, you know, there was a foundation already there, and you already had eyes to perceive this kind of vision, aided by um, Mr. Banal's medicine. So at that point then, you were 100% an artist and a writer. We're speaking today with Max Evans, one of New Mexico's most beloved writers, so we're grateful that you made that choice because it's, it's given us so many wonderful books. And of course, we're celebrating animal stories, a lifetime collection of stories. So I know you have many, many more stories in you. So will you have time to come back and tell us some more? Well, it'd be my pleasure. Well, our guest today has been Max Evans, New Mexico's most beloved writer. I want to thank you, our audience, for being with us this week on Report from Santa Fe. I'm Lorene Mills. Come back for more stories with Max Evans. Past archival programs of Report from Santa Fe are available at the website reportfromsantafe.com. If you have questions or comments, please email info at reportfromsantafe.com. Report from Santa Fe is made possible in part by grants from the members of the National Education Association of New Mexico, an organization of professionals who believe that investing in public education is an investment in our state's economic future, and by a grant from the Healy Foundation, Taos, New Mexico.